India's government is doing a lot to turn the most populous country on earth into a giant, both economically and politically. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Hindu BGP have been ruling India for 10 years. At the moment, everything looks as if this could remain the case, even after the end of the six-week parliamentary elections. Modi wants to modernize India and make it a geopolitical heavyweight. He skillfully navigates between the power blocks and presents himself as the mouthpiece of the voiceless in the so-called Global South. We are asking today, is India an underestimated superpower under Modi? Very welcome to The Point. I am very pleased to introduce my guests to you today, Walter J. Lindner, former ambassador to 2022 in India and author of the book The Old West and the New South, What We Should Learn from India Before It's Too Late. A warm welcome, Christian Wagner, India expert at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, is also very welcome, and Miriam Prize Hansen, India expert and head of the Global Order, and foreign policy research focus at the GIGA Institute. We'll be connected from Hamburg. Welcome. I'm glad you're all here and have time. Walter Lindner, you are asking us, I have just quoted, to learn from India. What did you take with you as the most important thing between the time as a backpacker in the 70s and then as a diplomat until 2022? What is it that the encounter with India has made rich for you? Quite a lot, to be honest. But I have been to many countries in the world, and India has never left me all my life. And both because it is an extreme country, both the positive and the negative. Poverty, heat, overpopulation. So what took me there is that there is a bigger world than the European one. A world that consists of 80% of the global south. Secondly, that it is a country that has developed enormously, and therefore, has a huge potential from digitization to other points. And thirdly, perhaps, as is often the case in Europe, Germany, but also in Europe, we are doing too much navel gazing by practically always dealing with our topics. You can see it now also with Russia, of course, and with other topics, but that in the rest of the world, other topics are often important as well. So the dimension of the world becomes clear to you when you travel through India, then you see that there is much more than just Europe. But if you now listen to German politics in the Bundestag, and also elsewhere, Miriam Prize Hansen, then the interest in India is still, yes, very great. The country seems to be in high demand. Many Western countries, but also Russia, want a close economic and foreign policy partnership with India. This is attractive. Actually, why? Well, when we talk about geopolitical and geoeconomic power factors, the sheer size of India is of course a factor here. So India is a huge market. We always hear now that 10% of humanity is currently involved in elections. And of course, India is a very outstanding partner in this regard. And of course, it also has the attractiveness that, as the largest democracy, it also has the same values in these. Values were mentioned earlier, as we apparently do. There will certainly be more to talk about this. But as I said, heavy size is simply a very big weight in world politics. And a lot of young people, Christian Wagner, so every second is under 25. What would you say? Because you have also known the country for a long time. Are we now underestimating India's capacity to be a superpower here in Germany, for example? Or are we currently overestimating it? It's a long discussion. The debate about the potential of India will be going on for a very long time now. There was an interesting study two or three years ago that said that India is actually a future market forever. So we don't have the problem that there is the potential, but the problem in India is rather that the potential is not realized. And there are actually the challenges that the country is facing. You can see it, for example, in the case of the, they address the young population. After all, India is hoping for the demographic dividend, that is, a high proportion of the young working population, which will then drive economic growth. But this also presupposes that there are appropriate jobs. This also presupposes that there are the appropriate levels of education. And this has not yet been seen in India. 
So in that sense, it's always both. We overestimate the country a little, we also underestimate it. And that will be the task of the Indian government to set the appropriate course, to initiate the reforms so that this potential, which we have been talking about for decades, can finally be realized. Let's take a closer look at this. What the current head of government has designed, what he wants to design. He is campaigning for his party to be re-elected, and more than 960 million people have the opportunity. Economic successes play a major role, but so does identity politics. Hindus first. With this ideology, Prime Minister Modi rules the largest democracy in the world. This makes him popular. About 80% of Indians are Hindus. Minorities and opposition members, on the other hand, report intimidation. Modi is popular because he has massive investments in infrastructure and has social programs. In the 10 years of his government so far, India has risen from 10th place to the fifth largest economic power, past the former colonial power Great Britain. By the end of the decade, India also wants to overtake Germany and Japan. With prestige successes such as the moon landing 2023, the country underlines its ambitions as a technology nation. And yet poverty remains a problem among the approximately 1,4 billion Indians, with an average annual per capita income of around $2,400. are found just a little ahead of Nicaragua. Demography, democracy and diversity from Modi's point of view, this triad speaks for India's unstoppable rise. Is India on the way to becoming a superpower? What would you say, Miriam Preshenson? Is India on the way to becoming a superpower or already a superpower? I believe that in many things, we can also be true and false, two things at the same time. So, as Mr. Wagner also said, I think the ambition has always been there. Migration has been around since Nero, since the 50s, that India should have the appealing, the corresponding power on world politics. And I think, and the Ukrainian war, I think, especially in the consciousness of the West, there are great, say, the word turn of the times caused, that now this is actually also perceived. But the fact that it is perceived, that they are serious about the seriousness with which we, I say now in Europe, in Germany, are now dealing with India, already shows that, I think, in the last two years a significant step has been taken in this direction of the actual world power, which is then also perceived in this way, just about this last time, all of them. Of course, there has always been a claim, and the orientation of foreign policy has now also developed in such a way that we also perceive this, and that the claim is there, and above all, if you just look at the statements of the Indian foreign minister, for example, this self-confidence and awareness of one's own importance is now just such that, I think, one can no longer get past India in many or most issues of world politics. Walter Lindner, you also had to deal directly with the Modi government. Is it the merit of this government to have advanced the development in such a way? So now it's at 6.2% economic growth currently, but there was also a lot of investment in infrastructure. There was digitalization. You have already mentioned that. Would you say this is Modi power? So a big part of it, yes. Of course, it was not that everything was dark before Modi and so on, but in the first legislative period of Modi. He made a huge amount of economic reforms, openings, and I think that people also took a lot of note of this. And also in the second part, so he continued this in the second legislative period. So I think a lot of things have come forward now because of Modi's policies. Also the international importance. The very fact that he led the G20 presidency last year was a prime example of how it should actually be done. And that's when they really showed that they are with the first players. When asked about the superpower, I don't think that would be the right word. Nowadays you can no longer act with the superpowers, and that is the only superpower that still exists at the moment, is the USA. Economy, military power. But it is multipolarity, and even India would not aspire to it. I want to become a superpower. They just want this domination of the world by a few groups of states, they don't want that right now.
You don't want an equidistance right now, but you want to have a block environment, so at least no military and polarizing blocks. And that, I think, is the great added value of India as well. We will not have a country today that has this size, not anyway, but with this size. It manages to have practically good relations with everyone. So to Israel and Palestine, to Ukraine and Russia, to the USA and Europe, and then even to China. They have a certain kind of pragmatism. So this kind of balancing of interests, which needs to have the greatest respect, and that's something I think we can often learn from India, or rather where we will need India very much. Without immediately reuniting it and saying so to say post-colonial, yes, we want to be by your side. You have to do that at a level, and then you will do it justice, I think. But economically, the announcement is already clearly there, Christian Wagner. One would like to overtake Japan, overtake Germany, and ultimately also come close to China. I contrast this with the actual economic performance. Three decimal places, seven trillions of dollars, to 2030 is the goal. Is it so far? And $6.7 trillion is the goal. Per capita income is to increase from the current $2,500 to 4500 Is the promise inside one thing that Modi will be able to keep? I think this is one of the great challenges because the government is already facing serious structural reforms, especially in the economic policy area. There is always a debate about whether India will become the new China. And there is a high probability that it will not, because the manufacturing sector, that is, the industrial sector, is de facto stagnating and will not penetrate into these large areas, as we have seen in the case of China. With large factories, for example. With the big factories. Of course, there is media coverage that Apple is now producing in India. That's all right. But if you just look at the share of the manufacturing sector in the gross national product, then it is well below 20%. I think... 14, 15%. The government wants to increase the share, but this is stagnating. The second big point, where reforms are also urgently needed. 40 to 50% of the employees are still employed in agriculture. That means that you have to somehow manage to bring about this structural change. But all Indian governments fail at this. This is not an omission of the Modi government now, this is an old discussion in India. The third point would be that if it does not come through the manufacturing sector, you can get it through the service sector. We'll see about that. The service sector is very important in India, but of course it will not create the corresponding jobs there. So the government is already facing a Herculean task. I'm not so optimistic because the growth figures are very good, yes. But there are also enough economists who say that the problem in India is not that you now have 6 to 7% growth. The problem will be that you actually have to have growth rates of up to 10% at least once by the end of the decade. That means that you have to dramatically accelerate this growth process once again to even get close to China. So there are a whole series of real challenges where the next government, if it is set by Mr. Modi, will also have to implement a series of profound reforms. India the new China, that would be interesting for Germany, Walter Linder, so, so to speak, to implement the slogan of de-risking towards China by focusing more on India. Is this an option? Is that even the way? Of course there are these considerations, and of course, there are quite a number of companies. Even quite a number of these companies visited in India itself, which then, which actually came from China. They said, now we're going away, and is it too unsafe, and so on. German companies. German companies, German companies. But firstly, I think it is still difficult to compare because the dimension of investment in China is incredibly higher than in India. Then there are infrastructure advantages and which practically have to be provided by those first. You still have to keep up with India, that is infrastructures, although they have already done a lot there. And then, I think I'm not sure that India wants this to be Plan B. Yes, you are going away from India, from China, come to us after all. Why not? Because they want to. The self-confidence that has just been mentioned before is also, we are no longer just the workbench and the raw material supplier. Supplier, where people come, they can produce cheaply. We also produce ourselves, which, by the way, we have seen with COVID, they have produced fantastic medicine. 
We produce made in India ourselves, and we also want to expand this into a brand, a quality brand, so to speak. BMW, for example, many come from India, and they are assembled there, totally assembled, and India is also proud of it. Because this is then a made in India vehicle. So in short, plan B, because the Germans have now come up with the whiskey or Europeans, but now come to us. We welcome them with open arms, but they also want to say with a certain self-confidence. We can also offer a whole range of things ourselves. What do you say, Miriam Preshenson, about the subject of India, the new China? Yes, so I think one of the buzzwords which is also mentioned in Indian politics is integration into global supply chains. Of course, this is much more pronounced in the case of China. And this is probably what India is still missing. And that doesn't mean we deliver. So India supplies raw materials and we do something on it but actually also high-tech production. Elon Musk has been or is currently in India, so these are very important issues that India is becoming part of this, including high technology and global supply chains in this area, and that's still missing at the moment. The other aspect, and I think we always have to be a little careful, that we don't see it as too big. India also has massive ones, I can't think of the word right now, tariffs and customs duties. So India is very much hindered, also, actually, its own integration in this case is a bit due to relatively high customs duties, relatively high import barriers. And there, I think, even if this is actually the 10% that is necessary, the goals, which are also mentioned again in the election manifesto, for example, how big the economy should be, there is still relatively much to do. And these are also the tensions that arise not only with economic decisions, but also with the political constraints that stand behind such a customs policy. So how do we deal with the need for, for example, the supply of components for solar panels, most of which still come from China? How is India dealing with this? And how do economic and political contexts and constraints overlap here, which then interact here, and then also represent the complexity in our politics? For the perception in the West, Christian Wagner, it is always important whether this actually remains the most populous democracy there. Now the returning officer promises us a festival of democracy in the parliamentary elections, which will last until June. Is this being adhered to? Is this a democracy where you can say, yes, without ifs and buts? I think we have seen the discussion in recent years that autocratic tendencies have increased since the Modi government took office. On the one hand, this concerns the discrimination of minorities, especially Muslims. This is simply due to the fact that Mr. Modi stands for an India as a Hindu nation, in which minorities, especially Muslims, are just second-class citizens. Secondly, there are massive restrictions on the freedom of opinion and the press. We have a number of opposition politicians, critical intellectuals, who are being subjected to criminal proceedings. Thirdly, there is also an effort on the part of the central government to expand the powers in relation to the federal states. So you are trying to change the separation of powers in the medium to long term, so to speak. So we are already seeing a number of developments that have meanwhile led to the fact that India and this is indeed formulated by Prime Minister Modi in this way, sees India as the mother of democracy, but also probably as a democracy by Indian standards. So these autocratic tendencies will then probably lead to the Indian self-understanding that they say, well, we are just a democracy, but no longer one that works according to Western standards, but that just has its own cultural standards. So firm this it is already a different understanding, this is also a very important point in your book, Walter Linder, that you are trying to explain to us. Why is it that the nationalist momentum is also important? Yes, I wanted to go back to what was predicted. I don't quite share that. Firstly, the question is, do we have to have a democracy? Does there have to be a democracy all over the world? That looks like in Bonn and like in Berlin. No, it doesn't have to. There are geographical peculiarities and there are regional peculiarities that make a democracy look a little different. Even German democracy is not perfect, even Indian democracy is not perfect. Now to hold this against him, in a country that we cannot even imagine, 
with 980 million voters, eligible voters, with a huge dimension, with 300 languages, with 10 world religions, with a geography that is very difficult. From Everest to the deserts, to hold an election, there and with always little, very little complaints, is already a great achievement. Secondly, when we say we have the same values as India. To be honest, when this comes from a Western mouth, I'm always a little skeptical. Have we always adhered to these values? Say, French Revolution, Enlightenment, Equality and so on, wonderful. What was in the First World War? What went out of Europe in the Second World War? What about the Holocaust? The biggest drop in values ever occurred to him with us. What is after the war? What about the Vietnam War? What happened to Iraq? What was? You name it, there were a lot of situations where we didn't pay attention to these values. Now, when we are going through the world, especially in the global south, and carrying it like a monstrance in front of us, pay attention to our values, then I understand that India and other countries are saying, wait a minute, stick to the values yourself, and stop with this moral index finger, and stop with these double standards. This is something I have always been able to understand, and to be honest, we have to make sure that we have the right tone of voice. You can address a lot of things, but not with this condescending, so to speak condescending tone. With Mr. Wagner, that sounded quite calm too. You want to add something else? Yes, so the point is not that we are now preaching to the Indian state, so to speak, what form of democracy it must have. After independence, India is probably the most successful democratic model that exists in countries of the global south. There are few other democracies that have lasted 1951 so long since the first election. So in that sense, I would say that the Indians have always had their own form of democracy. It was always a mixture of different cultural influences plus the Western institutions. That was exactly the hallmark of the Indian Union, and that was also the successful model. So my criticism is directed precisely at the fact that one is actually getting off one's own path, so to speak. And one of the most successful models of democracy that we had in non-Western societies is actually trying to unwind for nationalist reasons. And one does not really know whether this form of institutional stability, at least once, that the former Indian model of democracy had, whether this should then also be adhered to under the new and more nationalist model. So in that sense, I would say that I am now orienting myself less on our ideas, and I would say, no, of course not at all. But it has to be about how did Indian democracy itself develop. And just before the Modi era, it was a very successful model in the global south. How do you feel about this, Miriam Preeson? Yes, I see it quite similar to Mr. Wagner. I think that from this one can judge the developments within India, also from a scientific point of view. For example, how we do it, and such questions as freedom of the media. For example, we cooperate with many scientific institutions, and we simply see a dramatic deterioration in the ways in which we can cooperate with them. For example, there are research projects that we can no longer do together because certain institutions are no longer allowed to receive money from European institutions, from our institutions. So I don't think it's possible to compare Germany and India at all. But, as Mr. Wagner just said, India and India 15 years ago, where certain freedoms, democratic values were simply lived even more. And there is already the danger of growing authoritarianism which has grown very much with the centrality of Modi. Walter Linder Yes. Of course, as we said before, everything is there in India. Both what has been said now, and exactly the opposite. There is indeed a tendency of a shrinking space, ideas shrinking freedoms for civil society. But there is also opposite. I've been on dozens of interviews and talk shows like this one, where the scraps flew, where the Modi wasn't left with a good head of hair. That is, and in interviews, that is, the press could write totally openly, and you have a whole bunch of press organs in India that actually do that. You have politicians who don't have a good hair on him. That is, it's not that there is a listener there and so, mom, 
then when this is painted in such black and white, one thinks terribly. There is now a half-dictator here who rules there, and so on. It's not like that. It is an emphasis, an emphasis on self-awareness, an emphasis on Hinduism. Yes, but 80% of the country is Hindu. It's not a crime, that's for sure. 200 million are Muslims, and there are also Christians. Yes, exactly, but after all, 80% of the country is Hindu. If that's why the country is being shaped in a Hindu way, it's not a crime. It is only important that the minority rights for the 20%, as stipulated in the Constitution, are respected. And there are checks and balances, there are court cases, and there are indeed some things that can be criticized. But the question is whether you do it right away, as is unfortunately often done, with such a drawer, and immediately put the drawer on India. Yes, that's the tendency, say, that's how it is. India is too complex for that, and the conditions in India are also too complex for that. I would not sign to say that the Muslims are second-choice citizens there in India. I have also spoken to a lot of Muslim representatives who, of course, complain about the shrinking spaces, and about the curtailment of certain rights, and a certain tendency of Hindu fanatics, of course, but in general. If you look at the constitution, and if you look at the court decisions, and so on, it's not that they are a second generation, second quality person. But in fact, since we give them completely justly, one must be careful there. But Indian institutions are already paying attention to this. Now we don't need to constantly reinterpret with our index finger from the outside, and say that doesn't fit, that doesn't fit. We have to. Us. But the question is whether Modi is risking anything by doing so. What he promises to people, that would be the question for me. And then, I would also like to move on. Do you still have an answer to this? What do you think? I mean that if now so to speak, if we state here that this has intensified in recent years, this tendency, I think you have called this authoritarian tendency, then the question is, is he risking the course? The attractiveness that India is currently radiating, or not at all? No, I don't think he's risking it, because you always have to keep yourself in mind during the debates, and I don't think we do that enough. After all, Mr. Modi has a democratic mandate for the reconstruction of the Indian state, of Indian society. And he was re-elected at the last election, 2019, with a larger share of the vote than 2014. So we have to bill somewhere, he obviously appeals to a certain voter sentiment, and he also gets a mandate with it. So I think that makes the criticism of him much more difficult, because in the end we have to say, yes, he just has the corresponding majorities in Parliament, and then, of course, according to the Constitution. He may also rebuild the country according to these ideas. But it contains the dangers, and this is a discussion that is also being held, especially in India, that minorities will then be deprived of their previously granted rights, in which the minorities are a problem. That this is not always a problem for us will be seen in the discussion on a uniform civil law. This will probably eliminate a number of privileges for Muslims in terms of civil status law. But it will be justified from the Indian side with the reference to gender equality. This means that it will be said that a uniform civil law creates equality between the sexes. Men and women of all religious groups are treated equally. This shows the complexity, so to speak, because of course many Muslim associations would then say no. So we lose a part of our identity, so to speak. After all, all this is a discussion judging by what the global global challenges are. And then there are many countries that are just saying that we are simply accepting this now because we need India as a partner. The number of these countries has grown. And let's take a look at how much India has become popular with international partners. Standing ovations for the Indian premier in the US Congress in the summer of 2023. Modi can be celebrated as an advocate of democratic values on our partnership, on our people, on the opportunities that lie ahead, on two great friends, two great nations, and two great powers. Western democracies are courting Modi, also because they see India as a geopolitical counterweight to an increasingly aggressive China. But India pursues its own goals, for example, continues to obtain weapons and oil from Russia and has not distributed the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine to this day. 
Modi pretends to be a confident speaker of many countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, for which Europe's problems are quite far away, by saying, India is the voice of the global south. What foreign policy interests does India pursue under Modi? Lindner, there is a formula of the Indian foreign minister. I'll quote her in English, as she was read in the New York Times. Engage America, manage China, cultivate Europe, reassure Russia. Is this a good summary of what India is currently practicing? I have to say, the Indian foreign minister has a huge talent for getting points on things to the point, and, frankly, this is also one of his quotes. As we have said before, he does an excellent job of balancing these global powers of Indian interests. I believe that. I don't know whether this makes him the voice of the South, of the global South, because at least at least China also makes this claim. But I believe that India is already a little ahead of this because it has a certain more neutral position and has just proved that it behaves differently in different situations and does not advance its own, how should I say, extensive interests in this way. When you see that India always has its own position in the Security Council or in the United Nations. In the case of Russia, it often agrees with the Russian side, but not always either, but then also agrees with the Western side. It is the same with Israel that it represents a position that is quite different from the rest of the global south. So it also goes in there with a self-confidence and does not just say that we share everything that the global south is now putting forward here. So it has a weight for itself. And that's why I think it's a sought-after partner. We just heard it, for Biden. Incidentally, also for Trump before, he can also do it with Biden, so to speak. But also for the Europeans, but also for the Russians, but also the Ukrainian president himself was recently in India. That is, you play on all with all balls, but there was quite skillfully his own interests. And this, I think, is something that no one imitates him so easily. How do the others see it? Voice of the Global South. This juggling, is that something outstanding? Different thoughts. On the one hand, if we put this in again for a scientific component, it actually already behaves very much like a very typical rising power with a growing nationalist foreign policy, which is also sometimes quite sensitive to this very criticism from the outside, but which of course also carries the danger that it will turn over, if it is the expectation of the population, that India is increasingly aggressive, representing its own interests, that this, of course, also drives India into conflicts. You can see that a little bit in the assassination attempt in Canada, on this victory leader, that India always runs the risk of maneuvering itself a little bit out of the way by looking for conflicts and by a, and, this is a legendary future, a growing nationalist foreign policy, which then forces India to insist on its own positions. I believe that India has managed to develop its own style of foreign policy in this way. And I am also going along with Mr. Lindler. This is a very big one. This is a great success for India, but you have to ask yourself the question, how long can you stay on the fence? So that's how the law becomes. How long can you stay on the fence between the waves? And how long will this business last if the partners cannot be sure which side India will ultimately choose. So on the one hand, this is a very, very good starting point for India at the moment. But I wonder how long this can last, ideas how long India can hold on to this, or whether India can put itself in a position where it can hold this position as well. So where it does not then change into disappointments of the partner at some point, and thereby maneuvers itself out. We may have to bear this in mind again, in concrete terms. You can also do it with military politics, Christian Wagner. So, there will be, so to speak, military equipment is bought from the West, 
but also from Russia. They want to work closely with the USA, and at the same time with Russia. Is it something where you also see the same dangers as Ms. Prize Hansen, that this is not to be juggled in the long run? I think this will also be one of the great challenges for India, because one must not forget that if the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine continues now, if Russia is getting closer and closer to China, then of course one fears India. And there are already the first reports that there are problems with the supply of spare parts for Russian armaments. One should not underestimate that this military cooperation with Russia goes back to the 70s. That is, 60, 70 percent of the stock of the Indian armed forces comes from Soviet or Russian stocks. That's changing now. In the meantime, we see that the USA, and especially France, are the most important arms importers for India. But this could already become a problem. The Indian government, in turn, is trying to build an arms industry on its own. But this is also a rather long-term undertaking. In other words, we will also have to see from the Indian side how far we can compensate for the uncertainty in the Russian supply right now. By the rapid development of a national arms industry, or by increased imports from Western countries which, however, have the disadvantage that they will be significantly more expensive. So I think this remains a major challenge for security policy, especially in the military area. How do you see this? You have described that it is unique. This juggling, what does India need to get through this? Does India also need a stronger partnership with Europe, or do we not play a role at all? Yes, one can ask the other way around. Does Europe need a stronger partnership with India? So, as I said, to change the angle of view again. I do believe that this can work for quite some time, because there are uncertainties not only in the question, can you hold on to this? What are we going to do if Trump gets in on this? Can we maintain our position within NATO, our 2% target? Do we have to pay 3% then? What about social benefits? This means that there are, as India might also say, we are asking a question mark, as to how this will continue with the West. Take a look or the U is not always united and so on. So this questioning of India is fine, but there are, God knows, a whole series of challenges in the world that are added to this. I think India is doing it so cleverly at the moment. Whether this will continue. I think the India euphoria that there was a little bit last year because the G20 summit was there. Everyone went to India and put the latch in their hands and all the cabinets, even us in Germany. The ministers went there several times. Now the G is 20 in Brazil, next year in South Africa. Whether this presence that we had last year, including the media presence of India, will continue this year. I have a question mark about that, you asked at the beginning. But now it is the case that the Bundestag and Germany are much more concerned with India. People got busy last year, and maybe after COVID, they also got busy with the supply chains, dealt more with the almost continent in India. But of course they are also distracted now by the Middle East, by Ukraine, and now by the G20 presidency of the Brazilians. Whether this will continue, this dealing with India, I have my question mark. That is why I have also written such a book, to see, there are many reasons to continue to deal strongly with India. Miriam Prize Hansen, when the Indian Prime Minister now claims to be the voice of the Global South, what does he actually deduce from this? So you are investigating exactly these things. How does India now appear to be able to practically be this voice? What are the claims derived from this? I think on the one hand, India has been trying to develop new summits in the last two years which was called the Voice of the Global South, where India then invited and then presented itself very strongly as the Voice of the Global South. Whether the Global South, which is of course much more diverse than the categorization as the Global South implies, I believe that the Chinese model is still what is seen as attractive in many parts of the Global South. and India is trying to do it. I think in some ways, 
it is also successful especially with respect to the european partners with respect to the usa but if you look at an institution like the BRICS, for example where india and china actually work together and i say this deliberately with quotation marks then you can also see the difficulty of identifying a voice for the global south now so i think this is a bit difficult for me now but it may be a bit of a fashion which is just related to the ukrainian crisis and the sudden perception of the global south so my colleague johannes plageman has written a very great book which i would like to pigeon wits here this means that we are not all where this awareness that the global south is diverse is now also there and i believe that this is also the difficulty for india to present itself as the voice there and i am partly dealing with the climate regime a bit india is also viewed more critically there so it is precisely through these small island states that india is already perceived as one of the major emitters ids one of the largest emissions of greenhouse gases so i think that this cannot be put together in such a way that india can now present itself as a representative of the global south and i think these contradictions they show up in very different order we will now take this as a conclusion from you on the question of what the situation is like with the rise of india in the global south and worldwide i would also like to have a short conclusion from you christian wagner as mr lindner says india initially sees itself as a pole in a multipolar world it must be said that the constellations are now as good as never before india is politically courted but india is also economically attractive that is if the ascent of india is to take place then now and if it does not take place now then hiking what else do you add briefly i can only share and as i said i advise not to underestimate india i think we really have to reckon with that i thank you all for discussing for watching let's write to each other on youtube and see you soon in a nutshell